Only a tiny fraction of patients that suffer from back problems will benefit from surgery. Would you believe that only about 10% of patients who come to a spine surgeon's clinic for back pain or leg pain actually turn out to be candidates for surgery? Many patients have a mechanical problem that is much better dealt with by non-surgical means. Some patients have sciatica, but by the time they've come to see me, it's gotten better. So their symptoms just aren't bad enough to warrant surgery. Um, other patients really have a chronic pain disorder problem, and those patients only get worse with spine surgery. Another common reason I get referrals is because the primary care doctor wants me to order an MRI scan. As you will learn, MRI has a very high false positive rate. Bulging discs, and in some cases even spinal stenosis, may be seen in 60 to 90 percent of asymptomatic patients. These MRI findings may derail the treatment process because the focus becomes wanting to see the surgeon to see if the thing seen on MRI needs to be fixed, when in fact the best way to help the patient is to treat the pain, not the MRI finding. The take-home message is that there are only a few patterns of pain that will benefit from surgery, and there's no point in sending the patient to a surgeon unless they have a pain pattern that we know we can reliably improve with an operation. How do you tell who is a candidate? The good news is that it is very simple and it can be done in your office. You don't need a bunch of expensive tests to do this well. So who is a candidate for surgery? Anybody with clinical red flags, neurogenic claudication, sciatica that has failed conservative management. What about back dominant pain? Really, in the absence of red flags, most back-dominant pain is mechanical and treatment is non-surgical. The relatively rare exceptions include patients with obvious instability on x-ray films, such as ismic spondylolisthesis and, and failed surgical fusion. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. Step one is you have to rule out red flags. We will talk about this more in the sections to come, but it is important enough to bring it up more than once. The red flags can be grouped into four main groups, neurologic, tumor, infection, and trauma. The main neurologic one is cauda equina syndrome. This is a relatively rare condition, but it is one you certainly don't want to miss. I'll often get a frantic call from a GP who tells me about a patient with back pain who suddenly had an event like fecal incontinence or urinary incontinence, and they ask me whether the patient might have cauda equina syndrome. My first question is whether or not they've done a rectal examination. One of the earliest signs of cauda equina syndrome is numbness in the perineum, so-called saddle anesthesia. Fecal or urinary continence is a late finding. So if the history suggests cauda equina syndrome, examine the patient well, and if you're concerned, page the spine surgeon on call. The second one is tumor. One of my pet peeves is that this red flag is often missed or simply not communicated to the spine surgeon by the referring doctor. If the patient has a history of malignancy, even remote, maybe they had breast cancer 10 years ago, it's possible that new onset back pain could be metastatic disease. In a few patients, back pain will be the first sy symptom of a systemic malignancy. You should be suspicious if the pain is constant, present at rest like when they're lying in bed, and not getting better at all despite mechanical treatments. If you're suspicious of metastasis, it can be ruled out with a bone scan. The bone scan is as sensitive as MRI for metastasis. X-ray and CT scan are not very sensitive and should not be used as a screen for metastatic disease. Infection is also important to think about, especially if your patient uses IV drugs or is immunocompromised for some reason. Trauma is usually easy to pick up from the history and is important to remember even for minor trauma if the patient has osteoporosis. So screening for red flags sounds like a lot of work, but you can do it with a few simple questions. The past medical history should include, have you ever had any cancers or tumors? When you do the social history, do you take illicit drugs? On review of systems, have you had any unexplained weight loss? How about fever or chills? Has there been any change in your bladder or bowel function? After you rule out red flags, you need to find out if the patient's pain is mostly in their back or mostly in their legs. In a later section, Dr. Hall will explain how to do this well. Here's the key point. Unless the patient has red flags, 
Back pain, back dominant pain, is overwhelmingly mechanical in nature. The natural history of mechanical type back pain is favorable, and surgical treatments are not clearly proven to be any better than non-surgical treatments. The only exceptions, and they are fairly rare, are those patients with a serious mechanical problem. Usually this is so obvious it can be seen on a plain x-ray film. For example, a, a defect in the pars, interarticul pars interarticularis, that's the piece of bone between the facet joints. If that's missing, which it is in some people, it can cause spondylolisthesis, you know, slippage of one vertebra on another. Many of these patients can ha also have leg pain because as the vertebra slips forward, they get nerve root irritation. Another example would be somebody who had, who had a back fusion in the past, but it didn't heal properly. That's called pseudoarthrosis. The take-home message is that um, non-red flag back dominant pain is overwhelmingly non-surgical and therefore initial attempts at treatment should be by, by mechanical means, usually with the help of a physiotherapist or a chiropractor. Although in later sections Dr. Hall will show you some exercises that you can give your patients right in your office. MRI is very unlikely to change the management plan for patients with mechanical back pain. And as we've said, the findings on MRI usually only confuse the picture. Treat the patient. What about leg dominant pain? For neurogenic claudication, we get excellent results from surgery. There are randomized studies that clearly show that surgery is better than non-operative care for neurogenic claudication. Surgery is also useful for sciatica due to herniated discs. But the results of randomized trial for this condition are less clearly in the favor of surgery because many patients will get better on their own if you wait long enough. How do you make the diagnosis of neurogenic claudication? This can be made on history and clinical examination. Neurogenic claudication is leg dominant pain that comes on with walking or standing and is relieved at rest. You need to examine the patient and make sure they don't have signs of vascular insufficiency to the legs because vascular claudication can cause similar symptoms. To make a diagnosis of sciatica due to radiculopathy, you need to have a loss of reflex, numbness or weakness in a discrete nerve root distribution, plus findings of nerve root irritation. That means a positive straight leg raise test. For L5, numbness is usually in the dorsum of the foot and weakness is in the great toe or ankle extensors. For S1, numbness is characteristically along the outside or bottom of the foot and there is loss of the ankle jerk. In the sections ahead, we're going to show you how to reliably evaluate all of these things on history and physical examination. Remember that a sore hip or knee can confound the diagnosis. Many times I've been asked to see a patient with sciatica that turns out to have osteoarthritis of the hip. So make sure you check hip range of motion. So that's it. You can determine whether or not somebody needs to see a spine surgeon with a 10 minute history and physical examination in your office. You don't need an MRI or other sophisticated test to do this. Let's review. Who is a candidate for referral to a spine surgeon? Anybody with clinical red flags, you call the doctor on call. Neurogenic claudication, sciatica that has failed conservative management. So let's talk about the referral process to surgery. A question I am often asked by primary care doctors is whether to send a patient with a back problem to an orthopedic surgeon or to a neurosurgeon. Now there was a time when orthopedic surgeons did all the lumbar spine fusions and neurosurgery did all of the cervical disc surgery. But it has not been that way for a long time now. These days, both neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons do the same types of operations and we often work together. Variation in practice is much more dependent on the surgeon than the training background, whether it be orthopedic or neurosurgery. So the take home message is that for the vast majority of spine problems, there really is no difference. If you make a referral to surgery, it is generally best to make it to the department rather than to an individual surgeon, unless the patient requests otherwise. This way they will get to see the person with the shortest waiting list first. Remember that currently only about 10% of those patients who see the spine surgeon turn out to be surgical candidates. One of the major goals of the Saskatchewan Spine Pathway is to reduce these unnecessary referrals so that surgeons can get to patients that need surgery sooner. Our hope with the creation of this pathway is that instead of consulting the surgeon, primary care doctors will correctly identify and treat back problems in their clinic. If the treatment protocols we provide you fail, then you can refer the patient to the Saskatchewan Spine Pathway Clinics in Saskatoon or Regina. 
In those clinics, the pain pattern will be reassessed and one of three things will happen. Additional mechanical treatment may be initiated. The patient may be referred for imaging such as MRI or CT scan if necessary. Or the patient may be referred to a spine surgeon. The goal of the pathway is to provide you the education, tools and support you need to manage back problems. Direct referral to a spine surgeon should only be necessary when patients present with red flags. In other words, in the rare event of an emergency situation. Thank you.